It's great to be back together. Great to be back as a party, as a family. And I want to say a big thank you to Jake Berry, our chairman, because organising a conference is a mammoth undertaking. And a big thank you to our staff, our volunteers, and of course a huge thank you to you, our party members. I loved being party chairman. <laughs> I really did. I got a chance to work with you all. I got a chance to work with Ben, my co-chairman. And I got to work alongside Boris. And if I remember rightly, we did OK, didn't we? We got an 80-seat majority. We had a great team of MPs elected from all over our country. And with Boris's leadership, we delivered Brexit. He got us through COVID. And of course, he led the world in our support for Ukraine. It's a legacy that he should be proud of, and I was proud to serve under him. And it's a legacy that I know Liz Truss will build upon. And I've seen her take bold action when she was Foreign Secretary, her steadfast support for Ukraine and the way she stood up to Russia. Her passion. Her passion for the defense of our union and her determination to promote democracy and freedom around the world. And as Prime Minister, she is being bold now, helping with energy bills, ensuring that you can see a doctor promptly, reducing the taxes paid by ordinary, hardworking people across the country. I backed her from the start, and I know that I made the right choice. I am the Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. <laughs> I have to confess, it still sounds a little strange coming out of my mouth, but it is an honour, a genuine honour, to be the face and voice of our country overseas. I'm the... OK, yeah, why not? I'm the UK's sales guy. Uh, and I like to think I'm pretty good at sales. Uh, I mean, I hope so. I, for most of my adult life, that's what paid the bills. But I know that however good a salesperson I aspire to be, the greatest salesperson this UK, that the UK ever had, was Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Wow. She was our greatest diplomat, our greatest advocate, our greatest champion. She genuinely was Elizabeth the Great. And I've now also had the honour of meeting King Charles. And I know he will work tirelessly to continue the work that she did and be our new great ambassador. During the funeral week of Her Late Majesty, I was reminded of the standing that our country has in the world. And when I travel on behalf of our country, I'm lucky enough to see us, to see the UK as others see us. And I can tell you, the view of here from over there is really really good.
It's not a terribly fashionable thing to be proud of your country. But I am. So sue me. <laughs> My mother chose to make this country her home. She was a young woman from Sierra Leone who adored this country then, just as I adore this country now. Indeed. Indeed, I am from immigrant stock on both sides of my family. As I say, my mother came here from Sierra Leone in 1966, and my dad's family came here from Normandy in 1066. <laughs> Look, there will always be people that talk down our country. They will belittle our achievements. They will underestimate our standing. Those self-loathing keyboard warriors who hate our country's every success and pray for bad news. Those are the kind of people who aren't happy until they're unhappy. <laughs> They're the kind of people who want to stand on the sidelines, never contributing, only moaning and bleating. But that isn't us. That isn't this party. That isn't this government. That isn't this country. Yeah. We aren't commentators watching on the sidelines, saying, oh, I wouldn't have done it like that. We are players on the pitch. We make a difference. We promote our values. We compete on the world stage for the things that we know to be right. We believe in freedom. We believe in the rule of law. And we believe that an aggressor cannot invade its neighbour with impunity. And that conference is why we stand shoulder to shoulder with those brave Ukrainians defending their homeland. And Britain has to have the strategic endurance to see this through until their victory. Back in February this year, at the United Nations, I said that if Putin was foolish enough to attempt to invade Ukraine, the Ukrainians would defend their country ferociously. And they have done just that. Their bravery and passion have been amplified by the arms and the training that the UK has supplied. And we will support them until this war is won. We will support them until their territorial integrity is restored. And we will support them until the last Russian tank is dragged away by the last Ukrainian tractor. <laughs> We need to have the strategic endurance to see this through to the end. Because, because if we don't, we send a message to every potential aggressor that our resolve is fragile. And we cannot, we must not, we will not send that message out into the world. And if you are listening to this speech, Mr. Putin, or Mr. Lavrov. Let me be clear. We will never recognize the annexation of Luhansk, or Donetsk, or Kherson, or Zaporizhia, or Crimea.
they are Ukraine. And when Ukraine has won this war, and they will, then we will support them as they rebuild their homes, rebuild their economy, and rebuild their society. We will work with our friends and allies around the, whole, around the world to hold the perpetrators to account, to punish those who use rape as a weapon of war, to punish those who knowingly target civilian infrastructure, and to punish those who murder women and children. And we will not do this alone. We are a member of many international groups, the Commonwealth, NATO, the UN Security Council, AUKUS, the G7, the G20. And I intend to build more alliances, more friendships, more partnerships around the globe. That's why we have ambassadors and high commissioners and diplomats in hundreds of locations. It's why I and my fantastic team of ministers travel the world. Trust me, it isn't to pick up those giant Toblerones. <laughs> although I do like those giant terrorists. <laughs> Look, when, when there is a war, our work on the international stage is visible and it's obvious. Building coalitions of condemnation at the United Nations, for example. Coordinating sanctions against those who facilitate the war. Working to ensure that the exports of food and fertilizer from those Black Sea ports can continue. But much of what the FCDO does is less visible, but no less important. I've just returned from a series of meetings in East and Southeast Asia. I paid my respects at the funeral of Japan's former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Then I went to the Republic of Korea and then to Singapore. In each country, I met with senior ministers I met with members of the international business community. I set out the detail of the UK's Indo-Pacific tilt. The Indo-Pacific is a part of the world which is growing fast. And through trade agreements, cooperation agreements, and our ASEAN dialogue partner status, we are shrinking the distance between us. I spoke about the opportunities that are available to us all, and of course, I spoke about the role that China plays in the region and around the globe. I made our position clear that China could and should take a different path, that it should adhere to the rules and norms of the international community, and it should stop persecuting its people at home, and it should stop sanctioning my friends and colleagues in the UK Parliament. And, was, and whilst I was on the other side of the world, FCDO ministers were in the USA, in European capitals, in Africa. And uh, a number of my uh, ministers are overseas as I speak. Because we have to invest in our international partnerships. Patient but effective diplomacy. We invest time. We invest energy. And, yes, we invest money, because that's how we generate influence on the world stage. And that's how we drive improvements in the lives of people overseas and how we improve the lives of people here in the UK. The, the development money that we spend, our official development assistance, or ODA, it helps women and children who have been brutalised by conflict. It helps prevent starvation. We use our expertise 
in financial services through the British Investment Partnerships to amplify the money that we provide to part fund green energy projects, for example, or to increase trade, or to stimulate economic growth in some of the least developed countries in the world. We don't just stand idly by and watch problems happen. We step in to improve things. We're not passive, but we're active. It's the right thing to do. It helps people that need our help, but it also helps people here at home in the UK. Why? Because safe, secure, and prosperous countries don't generate refugees or hundreds of thousands of migrants. Safe, secure, and prosperous countries don't export terrorism. Safe, secure, and prosperous countries are good trade partners for us. So obviously, we want to see more safe, secure, and prosperous countries. That is the active role our ODA, our Official Development Assistance, plays. But just because we look to build prosperity in distant places, we mustn't forget the need to build prosperity closer to home. A, a good diplomatic and economic relationship with the EU and its member states is good for all of us. And we've worked closely on our sanctions packages against Russia and those Russians that have enabled the war in Ukraine. And I want to see more cooperation across the Channel and across the Irish Sea. And addressing the current problems with the Northern Ireland Protocol is key to doing that. And I want to ensure that we restore the integrity of the UK internal market. I want to protect North-South trade, but I also want to re restore the balance of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, which has been disrupted by the protocol. I want to see all the communities in Northern Ireland represented again at the Stormont Executive, so that devolved government can be properly re-established. And I will work hard to get that done. Last week, I spoke to the EU's lead negotiator, Vice President Maros Sefcovic, and we agreed on our desire to reach a solution that works for all parts of the UK, especially the people of Northern Ireland. So we have the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill working its way through Parliament. And in the meantime, we continue to pursue a negotiated settlement which respects the constitutional integrity of the United Kingdom and our single market and supports the institutions of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. As I've discussed, uh, my fantastic team of ministers, Vicky Ford, Jesse Norman, Leo Doherty, Zach Goldsmith, Tarek Ahmed, Gillian Keegan, well, you've got plenty to keep us busy. <laughs> but it is a job worth doing. Promoting global Britain on the world stage, and I know I know that I speak, to, I speak on behalf of all the ministers and all the diplomats and all the civil servants in the FCDO when I say it is an honour to represent the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland on the world stage because this is a great country, a country I am proud of, a country I love. Thank you.